All right, welcome everyone to another Vice Furnace. Um, Anthony says no word. Um, Norman and Tom, you guys are pretty much the only ones I've never seen at one of these events before. So tonight we're actually going to look at a cool, like really nifty industrial IoT product called the Senku Ball. Again, uh, that's going to be presented by uh, Norman. So I can talk about all kinds of things this evening because I've got a bit of a, a very patchy past. So um, I, I know about quite a few different aspects of, of development and, and starting companies, running companies, selling companies. So um, I, I thought it would be interesting just to hear who's here and what you would be interested in, in talking about. Um, so, so are there, is there anybody here who's in the startup community looking to start up a business or is interested in um, starting something new? Is that a, a thing for, for one yeah, there? Well, I'm chair of 1804. So, of course. Uh, I mean, that's startup. Yep. Area. Yep. And for the other people, casual coders, just people who enjoy coding and industry professionals, coding professionals? Yep. Yeah? Just okay. Coders. Hardware developers? A couple of hardware developers. Okay. All right. Well, a bit of a mixed bag then. So we'll we'll take it. But yeah, just ask questions. Just, you know, let's make it interactive. We, we did this so, so that we could make it more interactive than maybe usual. So um, who's Norman? Well, you know, I suppose at heart I'm an engineer. Uh, I grew up in Cape Town in South Africa. It's a tremendously beautiful place. I suppose I still miss it. Um, I went to university. Well, I don't know. My mouse won't show up there, will it? No, that's a pity. Um, so I went to university on the edge of the, the big mountain there, the big flat mountain, Table Mountain, and it's a beautiful old colonial building there. Um, the university is really beautiful. So I went to university there and then joined General Electric as an engineer, designed all kinds of things. That detector up there is likely to be one that I was involved in at some level. Um, so did a lot of electronics development, software development for many years, and then uh, joined a company called Avnet. Has anyone heard of Avnet? So if you buy components at any level, if you buy lots of components, they're a, a global multinational component distributor. So it, it was quite interesting to go from, um, from engineering and then to get a call and say, hey, do you want to come join us in what was a pretty much a sales role, a technical sales role? And um, that was that was pretty horrible, uh, to be honest. The first, you know, first couple of months of picking up that phone and having to cold call customers was horrible. But but it taught me a lot. How many years had you been? I think I'd been with General Electric for three years. So yeah, pretty fresh still. But um, yeah, and then um, you know, in Motorola, does anyone know Motorola still? It, it's so sad that you know, the younger generation tells that. So um, Motorola, by the way, the, the Moto stands for car and the, the roller is Spanish for sound. And that's where they started was audio sound or sound in vehicles. So that's Motorola. Um, so I, I ran Motorola in Southern Africa and uh, you know, Indian Ocean Islands and took over Africa and Middle East eventually. And, and as far as semiconductors was concerned, so we, my job was to grow the semiconductor market in, in Africa and the Middle East. And we did really well. Um, it, it went really well. But what I found interesting was moving from an engineering um, start through to um, sales, through to sort of business development, which was still very technical. It was still walking into an engineer's office and trying to convince them that that 32-bit architecture was better than you know the 16-bit Atmel. And so it was still very technical. But I must have visited 4,000 startups and small businesses over the probably eight years I was with Motorola. So you, you gained this ability to walk into a, an office, shake the guy's hand, ask him what he does, and within 30 seconds, you just knew if you were wasting your time and should walk out or carry on. And it, so it's pretty un uncanny because you, you, you can pick it. You know, the, and, and to be honest, prob I've tried to work out what it is, but I think if you walk in and the engineer immediately you meet wants to dive into detail and show you exactly how the thing works, then probably he needs to hire a marketing guy who will rather tell you what he's done and, and why it should be a success. But So that was interesting, seeing all of these companies. And, um, and then, um, yeah, so from Motorola, actually, to be honest, I, I just got sick of being shot at. 
and that's a thing in Africa. So yeah, <laughs> got on a plane one day pretty quickly and came out over here. And I remember sitting on the plane and trying to work out, writing down what had made all the companies that I'd visited that were successful, what made them successful. And I came up with this big list of, of why they were successful, why they were not successful. And I still sometimes visit that list today. It's, it's still interesting. So um, anyway, I came out here and then realized that, you know, flew to Singleton because it was about that far from the sea on the map. And we had family there, so we thought it was like a coastal town. And, um, but it wasn't. So I um, stayed in Singleton for a few years and um, came on down here. But, of course, in Singleton, there was nothing to do except drive a mining truck. So the only option was to start a little business. So started Hummingbird Electronics. And um, that grew, and then we moved it down to Port Stevens. And in the end, we had a few hundred products that we made, um, and um, not all of them in any volume, but there were lots and lots of products. And Red Hummingbird was then sold to Red Arc, must be five years ago. You guys know Red Arc? Red Arc Electronics? Yeah, the big 4 by 4 automotive electronics suppliers. Sold to them, worked there for four years, and then decided to do something new. And um, that had to be Internet of Things. It just had to be because that's everything at the moment. So, so Sinkwip was started as a uh, an Internet of Things company. Okay. So what do we do? Um, it's it's actually quite interesting. If I were to ask you, Eric, what do you do? What does Safi do? Product development. Okay. It's, it's quite a hard thing to answer when somebody puts you on a spot, you know, that so-called elevator pitch, um, to actually, what do you do? And, and I find in Internet of Things, it's even harder. What do you do? What, what, what do we make? Is it a telematics device because it goes in a car? Um, and you go talk to an automation guy and suddenly he's saying, oh, yeah, that's quite a nice RTU. And you're thinking, what's that? Or is it a telemetry device or a data logger to some people or a sensor gateway is the other thing we thought maybe we'd made? So it took quite a long time to work out that I think what we do is that Senquip manufactures rugged, programmable telemetry devices that can connect any sensor to the internet. That is, I think, what we do. But it's taken quite a lot, lot of time to work that out, that, that that's what we do. That, that might sound silly, but um, it took a while. Um, and everything we make, make, make is made in Australia. So um, that's us. I wasn't sure what the mix was going to be, um, and I wanted to know, it's, it's, who here is involved in Internet of Things? All right, so everyone. And, and what sort of networks are you using? So, yeah, and everyone else? Anyone on LoRa? Anyone on Sigfox? That's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's really interesting. I expected there to be a little more opposition in the room today. Um, so, yeah, we, we went uh, Wi-Fi and, and 4G, Cat M1. Um, and so I don't need to convince you why, it sounds like. Um, and to be honest, even that was a very hard decision because in the beginning we looked at LoRa rolling out in the Netherlands and across the UK, and we thought, fantastic, cheap, um, really, uh, you know, good... Yeah, and, and then it became all fragmented in Australia, and then there's this crowd and that crowd, and everyone in the council owned the network, and then this private organisation. So yeah, so I, I think we made the right choice. Um, Wi-Fi and 4G. Yeah, every time I look at it, I think so much. I, I, I want to use Roy, you know, like I, yeah. I want to do it. Yeah. I just, every time I pick it up, I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> And, and then you've got to have a Laura Gateway and a broker and, oh, no. yeah, yeah, you've got to become a talker, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing I find is that you pick up a Laura thing and actually the radio might be based on a Laura radio, but it's not actually Laura. So, we're, yeah, so. okay, preaching to the converted. <laughs> so we make a claim, really, that the, the Senquip orb connects to anything any industrial sensor. Um, and that, that's actually the PCB that's inside it. So that um, we tried in, in previous roles, and even in Senquip, we tried 
two years ago, making the PCB in China, having it assembled in China. And it's the same thing. The first batch is great. Maybe the second batch is great. The third batch is awful. And the consistency, just we couldn't get consistency. So um, that PCB is manufactured in Sydney. Uh, components are placed in Sydney. And you know what? Maybe we pay $5 more. Um, but the cool thing about it is that when the once the board is assembled, they program it in Sydney at the assembler. It connects straight to their Wi-Fi network in the test jig, uploads all of their test data onto our servers, and we can then log the board from the moment Essentially, it comes hot off the off the assembly machines. So we can do things like we can say, we know you replaced that accelerometer four times, so we're not accepting that board. So it, you know, Internet of Things starts really, I think, right at the factory, which is pretty cool. I don't know why, but Thailand's really active today. Okay, well, <laughs> it's all the PCB assemblers in Thailand. <laughs> what? You're doing it in Australia? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so in terms of what it can connect to, it, it, is, it is quite challenging because um, you can put a voltage in from 0 to 75 volts. You can put um, a frequency in. You can put pulses in. You might want to count those pulses. Uh, you can drive 4 to 20 milliamp sensors with that device. You can read 485. You can read RS-232. You can do Modbus. Um, you've got some outputs. And so to, to, to multiplex all of those features on the pins was quite a challenge, actually. And it's quite easy to do it, but it's quite hard to do it such that someone can't destroy it. Um, and that really has been, was quite a challenge. So we, we think we're nearly there. That's not a challenge. Um, yeah, that's right. And then the, the software developers go mad with me because... You know, it's actually got Bluetooth on it as well. So then that opens up the whole world because suddenly now it can be a gateway that can collect Bluetooth data. And so we can monitor temperatures and vibrations and things via temperature. And we can log whether people are in a vehicle or, or assets are on the back of the vehicle. So, you know, Bluetooth is a thing. And, um, yeah, the next thing it's going to be, you know, but hang on, we've got Wi-Fi on here. Can't we also connect, connect to devices? So it really is a device, we think, that can connect to almost... Almost anything. Um, so when we when we measure uh, data, we'll send it to the SyncWeb portal. But we also believe in making data available to, to customers. So we're never going to insist that you use our portal. And in fact, what we find often is much bigger companies don't want to deal with our portal and another portal, and they've got a business system, so they'd rather have that data uh, in, in a unifying system. So we very much believe that customers must have that choice. And so it is simple, as simple as putting in an IP address and a port and the device will send data uh, to where you want it to go. have that choice. And, and I, I'm a big fan of live demos, um, although it's very risky. Has anyone got a UDP server running on their laptop that's in this audience? Okay, well, we might want to download one. Uh, there's some pretty nice free ones. We could see if we could get it working in five minutes. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is our portal. You'll see a bit of it later, um, but, but essentially customers have the choice. I'm going to show you quickly um, how they have choice. So that's a network diagram for, uh, our, for, for SendQuip essentially. And on the left there, I wish I had a laser pointer. Um, on the left is the SendQuip orb itself with the sensors feeding in from the bottom. And um, inside the orb itself, we're obviously running, um, we've, we've, we, we, we wake up on a time period, we measure those sensors, and then we transmit. And on the top right there, we're transmitting over MQTT through the internet um, to the SyncWeb cloud. In the SyncWeb cloud, we've got an MQTT broker sitting on the other side there, receiving the data um, and saving it into an Amazon database. But what makes the orb a little unusual is you can maintain that connection at the top there and you can maintain a second connection at the same time to a second MQTT broker, which might be associated with a SCADA system or just somebody else's portal. Um, and it doesn't have to be MQTT. Uh, it could be MQTT, UDP, it could be HTTP, but you can maintain both of those connections at the same time. Um, 
So the other way you could do it is from the SendCook cloud in the top right there, uh, we can, we've got an API. So we could go from the SendCook cloud into somebody else's uh, servers and systems. All of this is done in a, in a very secure way. Uh, certificates are uploaded to the device. From the ground up, security was, was paramount. You've heard the stories of people hacking into networks through baby monitors. And uh, have you heard the one about the laser and the, um, the Siri or, the, um, or the, the little voice activated device? So you shine a laser through a window, you modulate voice onto it, onto the speaker, uh, or onto just the case. And the light is enough to activate, well, it doesn't activate the speaker, but I suppose electronically something, some capacitive coupling, something's happening. Um, and so if you modulate voice onto a laser, point it through a window at, at the device and tell it to open the garage door, for instance, the garage door opens. So there's a wonderful use case about that on the internet about you know, people doing this. So yeah, so security has been really big for us from the beginning. And, and, you know, that's another thing, I, I suppose, if you were all hardware developers here, I'd be saying to you that, you know, doing this is easy, doing it well has turned out to be very hard. Um, so it's very easy to make a device that's not reliable. Um, it's damn hard to make it work uh, in reality. So our markets. Um, very specifically, we, we now know what our markets are. It's utilities mining, smart vehicles, industrial automation. Um, that's where we sell our products. So, and it's interesting to me more that to understand where it's not used. And so farming, for instance, is a market where we, we're just not going to play because you need $10 sensors and it's a disparate mess of networks. You, Laura might be well suited to a single farm. Um, even there, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe satellite is the answer. I don't know. Um, but farming is a market that we found incredibly difficult. Too many players um, and the networks are so fragmented that we don't play in farming. So that, that a combination of both and maybe Yeah. 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 So the thing is, ours is a device that you've got to pick a market, I think. And, you know, we could have picked a single function device that did one thing well, like a moisture soil meter. Um, and then you could build it to a cost. Ours is a device where I almost don't care what your problem is. As a big corporate client or an automation company, you've got a problem, you reach over there, you pick up your orb and you use it because whatever you need it to do, it can almost certainly do it. So we've gone for a market that is, um, we won't get the big volume uh, of, of a humidity sensor or, or a thermometer on the wall. That's, that's not where we're gonna play. Uh, we won't, for instance, do gas metering. Uh, residential gas metering, electricity metering, water metering, highly unlikely we'll play in that space because those are $50 sensors made in Asia by the millions. Um, so... Ready for a random question? Yes. Have you ever been in a street fight? <laughs> <laughs> I have been shot at multiple times. Does that help? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, <It's ready. laughs> yeah, that's right. I've driven over someone. <laughs> <laughs> to escape a street fight. Um, so, yeah, so, um, you, yeah, we, we had to choose a market, and our market is more that niche industrial, I suppose. Your drug is turned into raspberry pies in a way. In a way. But, but that's much more sophisticated. Yeah. So it, it was also interesting as well, when we started looking at this market, um, there are so many raspberry pie in a box oh. solutions. And, but you know, I'm going to show you later on. We were, we were driving here on the way and watching a, 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 one of our orbs that was, I don't know, I can't pronounce the name. It's in the center of Australia, just below Alice Springs, a little bit to the west. And it was 51.3 degrees ambient. And this orb is sitting in the sun on top of a container. And the container is a generator that is generating heat. And it must work every day, all day, forever. And, you know, you, you, that scares, that's scary stuff. If, if I had a Raspberry Pi in a box operating at 51 degrees in the sun on top of a container, I wouldn't be very confident right now. What's your design like? What is out there? What are you saying? So it depends. Commercially, we only guaranteeing it for one year. We expect it's going to last 10 years. The reality is that we've designed it for the life of what we expect the networks to be. 
So in 10 years' time, I imagine Telstra is going to be putting out a notification to say that 4G is dead, 12G is the new thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, realistically, I think looking oh, past... Well, that's very interesting, yeah. Um, so, so it's pointless almost designing past, I think, a 10-year lifespan at this moment because the networks just aren't going to support it. So, so with, with mining, you picked that over, say, farming. Um, a lot of the applications that I've seen people try to do, they have the same problem in mining and farming in that network. Um, no, well, we don't, um, mainly because the mines have got money. If there's a, and, and this is another thing. Um, Sorry, they, they, yes. they don't have... Oh, but they do now. So, for instance, we've got some devices going off to a test lab at Rio next week uh, because they've got an autonomous mine site, Kadudari, I think it is Kadudari, totally autonomous. Um, and we, we control their lighting plants so they can turn them on and off. They can monitor all kinds of things about their lighting plants remotely. So they just slapped 4G network across their mine site. It only cost them about 12 million. It was nothing. It's nothing. So we don't have the problem in mining that we do in farming. It's almost like um, the money's just not a problem. So if you need network connectivity, just put it in. So, mm. But mining's difficult because until you're in these companies, they're very hard to get into. Um, and yeah, so until, until you've got a couple of units on their machines doing something useful, very hard market to get into. So I think it was harder almost to define where we didn't want to play um, than where we did want to play. So yeah, uh, these things are built tough and uh, I'll pass one around. You know, it's, we expect them to be abused. Um, so, you know, it's stainless steel, it's brass, it's... If you want to mount it on a wall, uh, you would do that with the brackets. We thought it was quite smart that if you wanted to put it on a pole, you do that with the brackets. So uh, if you want to put it on a panel, then you just do that. And we've got magnets as well for temporary installs. But, you know, it's, it's again, from, from an engineering perspective, I, I'm very happy with this product. There's a lot of thought in it. If you're up a pole, for instance, um, and it's, you, so you've got one, a screwdriver in one hand, the last thing you want to do is undo one of these screws and it falls out. So they're captive. Um, if you're, you know, like there with a the screwdriver, often or up there, um, you've got six screws. Which one's the one that's holding the enclosure in? How many times have you tried to open a box and there's a screw that's holding the the, the lid closed? So the moment these ones unscrew, they they, they flip out. So they're spring loaded, um, and they're captive. So even the screws, we've put quite a lot of thought into. Um, there's a crush seal over there, so it's a, a proper O-ring. It, it, um, it survives meters under the water. Um, these are all brass inserts uh, in, in the tool. If you get dust and dirt in there, it can go right through, so we made sure it wasn't shut off at the back. Um, that little pink thing over there, that was an expensive lesson. Um, I once shipped a whole bunch of boxes that were IP 67, 68, I'm not sure what they were, but they were absolutely airtight with LCD displays in the front uh, in an airplane. They went into the cargo hold and the screens cracked because the air couldn't get in and out, so it, it came out uh, by cracking the LCDs. Um, so that's a gore vent. Same sort of thing as your raincoat material. It allows air through, but it doesn't allow moisture through. So you can have that on the side of a mining machine uh, and you can spray it with freezing cold water on a 50 degree day and the air will equalize and the, it won't crush the enclosure. So there's a lot of thought gone into all these little things. Um, that hinge it doesn't require any pins. So you don't have actions in your tool that are expensive. Uh, all kinds of interesting engineering problems that had to be solved. So I'll pass that around. Uh, little integrated buttons. Um, did you notice on the circuit board that the LEDs are mounted underneath and they shine through the board? It's also a little unusual. Haven't seen that done often. So, okay, so fess up. Right, so the actual enclosure is manufactured in China. We had the tools, we own the tools, it's our design, but we had it made in China. Now, we did that because, well, it was two years ago where everyone loved China. Um, but also, 
we find the quoting response out of the tool makers in China is just so fantastic. You send them a file, three days later you've got a quote, four weeks later you've got off-tool samples. Um, the response, the service is just fabulous. Uh, and the parts cost virtually nothing. So, you know, the, the, the money's in the development of, of, of the design. The most expensive part of an enclosure is the industrial design of it in the beginning. Um, um, no, you pay for the tooling. Yeah, you'll pay for the tooling to get off tool. So these are off tool samples. This is our next device. So these arrived um, literally a couple of, about a week ago. Um, so they're off tool. So they're not textured yet. They're, they're smooth. Um, the, the last thing they do is texture a tool because once they've done that, it's hard to make a change. Uh, so they sandblast the tool as the last action, texturing it. Um, so those are off-tool samples. So that's a DIN mount version uh, with external antennas down the bottom. So yeah, it's, it's you know it's it's easy to say, and I see it on so many websites. Built tough, built for Australian conditions, and it's a project box somebody bought from JCAR, and it's got a gland in the bottom. And, you know, it's um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a wake up call, as you say, when you see the, where these things go. Um, yeah, we've got we've got an application where somebody is monitoring exhaust temperature, pressure, and some other parameters associated with exhaust gas. They log that data to the device, and then when it drives past a Wi-Fi hotspot in the mine, so it's a gold mine, it uploads all the data. Underground coal is going to cost us a whole heap more because it's got to be intrinsically safe. So that's next step. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Not looking forward to it. And, you know, the other thing is you, you design your product, uh, which is relatively cheap, then you hit certification. Um, and, you know, each one of those little pieces of paper there's probably got about $6,000 written on it. it. It just costs a fortune to certify a uh, product in Australia. So, but you must. But you must. You must. You have to. Yeah. Because if some, it, it's fine until it goes wrong. While everything's working fine, it really doesn't matter. But the day something goes wrong, you want those pieces of paper. So this thing will run on solar. It's got a regulator built into it. It's got an internal battery in it. You don't need those Duracells. It, it's so uh, you can just put a panel straight on it. It'll charge the internal battery and it'll run. Um, you can run it off AA batteries as well if you want, and everyone always asks how long does it last, and I will always say to them I don't know, um, because it depends what you're doing. But if you do nothing other than wake up, take a measurement of something that's really low current and go back to sleep every now and then, it could last in theory up to about 10 years, because the sleep currents are about 40 microamps. So it's been an interesting design challenge here. Um, it runs at 40 microamps sleep when running off double A's, yet you can put DC power in up to 75 volts and it's got to take that. So that was a really interesting combination of, of power supply going on inside it. That wasn't easy to get right. Notice the little tab on the SIM card holder at the bottom. It's another little design feature. If you're putting this on a mining truck, and you've got a standard SIM holder, how can you ensure that the SIM doesn't pop out? So, you know, it's really cheap in the plastics to put a second little latch in your plastic. So if it does eject, well, it's not going anywhere. It keeps working. So, so many little little things that you don't notice um, at first glance. And that was the, the industrial design that we've done by someone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and lots of communication with customers. Um, we wouldn't have picked a lot of these features if we hadn't been talking to customers. So. so there's something else unique about our device. It it goes to sleep most of the time, probably, especially if it's running off batteries. It wakes up, it does all its measurements. But then what's unusual is it can run a piece of JavaScript that you've written. So you can actually write JavaScript, send it as a setting, um, and it'll execute after it's done all its measurements. And that's interesting because you could do something like you could have a, some serial data coming in from some sensor and the script could parse that data, uh, take bytes three and four, multiply them by 1.05, divide by two, um, and then send that as a parameter which might be degrees Celsius. So you can actually parse data real time on the orb. 
the other thing pausing lets you do, or sorry, scripting lets you do, is you might say, I want an alert if my oil pressure is more than this. But probably you don't want that alert if the speed is more than that, uh, or less than that. Or there'll be some combination of, um, of parameters that, that, you, that actually determine an alert. And, and with just settings, it's very hard because you can put a maximum, you can put a minimum, but it's very hard to say, I want a warning if the temperature is greater than this and that. Oh, but hang on, except when that. Um, so with scripting, you can create custom alerts, which is really powerful. Um, also, if you lose control of something, say you're filling a tank um, and your, your, your script said something like, or on a standard device, it said, if my level's low, turn the output on, fill the tank. When it gets high, stop. Um, if that were controlled over the internet and you lost that connection, what's going to happen? At least then you could have the, the local script take over and, and do that. So lots of uses for scripting. So yeah, th this, this slide really is just, this is the reality of you go and sell that Raspberry Pi in a box. This is where it's going to end up. So that machine is probably worth $25 million. It's sitting in the Pilbara. It is 2,000 kilometers from anyone who knows how to press a reset button. Um, it is a long way away. And, you know, look at that machine and you realize, you know, there's our device. So, you know, there's, look at the horn there. Look at the horn there. The horn's just below the cab. Um, honestly, we're about a pixel on that display. But that's the reality um, yeah, of what you're really dealing with. And that's quite frightening. When you realize your product's actually doing something that's going to either save someone a lot of money or cost someone a lot of money, you kind of want those pieces of paper. So, so that wasn't meant to end. Anyway, um, so yeah, so this is a product that we're very proud of what we've created actually, because a lot of a lot of effort's gone into it. We. We were talking the other day, we reckon 6,000 hours has gone into developing this product to this point. And um, yeah, it's, it's a product that's made in Australia and we, we think we can say it's made to, to last in Australian conditions. Um, so yeah, proudly, proudly Australian. So, so, that, so that's the, the talk bit of, of the evening. Any questions? So we don't play in the consumer market. So you could easily find out that these will list for about $1,300. And for $1,300, you'll get a device that has Cat M1, Wi-Fi. They've all got GPS built in. They've all got accelerometers and um, other sensors, pressure sensors. So they come with a raft of sensors, and then you can connect your own. Um, so there's enough margin at $1,300. Uh, realize that if you've got a distributor, they're going to want to make 30%. Um, and then you've probably got a trade in there somewhere as well, and they're going to want to make 30%. So again, you've got to be so careful because so many startups start up and they'll take the value of their components and they'll multiply by one and a half and say, well, I'm making a 50% markup on my components because I'm sitting soldering the board myself and I'll discount that time. And so they might win some business for a while, but then when you start to scale, suddenly you're going to employ someone to solder and you'd better hope you'd included that time at a real wage rate. Um, and then you start selling some and then you realize you get a distributor phoning you up one day and say, well, I want to sell a thousand, uh, but I need a margin. And then suddenly you, you're out of business. So, you know, yeah, at, at $1,300, everyone manages to make a reasonable margin along the chain. So at the moment, we're building PCBs in batches of 100 or 250, depending. Um, enclosures will do more than that. Uh, so we'd, we wouldn't bother to do a run of enclosures at less than 500. Yep. So, mm. Jen, even, the, even the batteries inside it are, are bespoke. Everything becomes, you know, 
those screws with the springs, they're all designed screws. Um, so there you're ordering 5,000 at a time. And um, so it depends on the component. Yeah, I actually saw a release from Telstra about two weeks ago on eSIMS uh, on LinkedIn saying that you can now get it for your Android device and your um, iPhone. We're ready for eSIMS. We can't wait for eSIMS. So the, mo the modems we've got are eSIM compatible, but for smaller players, not yet, unfortunately. So the, the processor here is a device actually that you'll all know, which is an ESP32. I think most of you will know it. Um, and it's turned out to be a remarkably reliable little processor. Um, it's made a lot smarter by the operating systems that we're running on, on the device. And um, those operating systems, we do pay for the operating systems because we want something um, to whom somebody's accountable. Um, so there are a lot of free operating systems out there. You know, we're not using them. Um, the one we use is tried and tested. So. Um, we do the testing ourselves. Yeah. So the, the devices are 100% tested. Um, as I say, they're, they're probably about 90% tested but the moment they leave those surface mount machines and then before they leave us, um, they test it again thoroughly. Why um, the shrinking to the JavaScript? Well, the product's being sold to a generation who, I think you said earlier, everyone ends up being a web developer. And so it's a fairly light language. It's fairly universal, and so it was an obvious choice for a small, it allowed a reasonably small interpreter uh, to be put onto the orb, uh, whereas other languages would have been a much bigger code chunk. And from a marketing rationale, it, there's so many reasons to want to do this, because what happens when you make a device like this is someone will phone up and say, great, you've got a warning and an alarm uh, on your accelerometer. Can I have a, an alarm two level? And then you've got to rewrite the code, re-release it, retest it, um, and that's for one customer. Now we can say, by all means, do you want three warning and alarm levels? Just script it. Um, so it actually, it's pretty self-serving, um, and it, it really makes it flexible. So, twelve point two four six kilobytes, twelve k. So, yeah, and again, you know, um, scripting, it's interesting because scripting does give people a lot more options to do some fairly frightening things to the device. So we've tried to protect it, but, um, you know, if people want a script, they need to test their applications. Um, it's, it's, it's reasonably easy to write a bad script. So a memory hogging script, for instance. It, it, you, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely no issue. Um, I think refreshing is how the automation companies are finding it. Yeah. So uh, I'd use that word. The other thing is that in mining applications, sometimes or in some applications, people just don't want scripting. They, they don't, you know, it 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 raises security concerns. Um, if you are really smart with a script, you may be able to do something um, that I want you to. Do. So you have to, you know, you have to opt in for scripting. Uh, we have to give you the right to script, first of all, as a user, and then you have to opt in on the device. So, yeah. But if a startup had um, a product that they wanted to sell to a, to a customer, um, and ordinarily they might have to solve their own problem around that thing, but would they, would they just buy this off you and add it to their product and go to the customer, or would they partner with you or help? It's a very good question, and 
it's it's something that look I'm, I'm I've always been a tinkerer. So my fir- I need something. The first thing I do is go and buy a little board, and it's covered in wires. And then I realize I've spent four hundred hours on it or something. And, <laughs> you know, and and I do think we have to change that mentality because we engineers love to fiddle. But the reality is, if there's something out there already, rather do the fiddling at modular level uh, is what I'd be saying. To develop hardware, the reality is to develop hardware and sell it with confidence is going to cost you two, three hundred thousand dollars by the time you've got a product on the table. That's the reality. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's an expensive game and it's easy to get it really wrong. So if you look at hardware startups, software startups, the hardware startups fail because it's not easy. It's easy to do hardware badly. Um, so, yeah, so what, that's our market. If you're a Newcastle-based company and you're making a machine that's got a controller in it and suddenly you want comms, you could redesign that whole board, get it certified, get it certified by Telstra, by the ACMA, um, or you could say, I've got a board that's already spitting out RS-485 or Modbus or something. Stick that on, you're in the cloud. That, that's exactly the market. Um, so, so potentially, because I've, I've had a few people come to me um, along those lines, and I didn't know it was something like yours, I've been pointing them away. Um, thank you. So potentially, they, they, instead of them mucking around with hardware, they could just focus purely on a, on a business model like SaaS based or something and plant with you on hardware. Mm. That's right. And, and often, you know, what's their real value? If they are a hardware company, Maybe they've divine, designed some fantastic new way of sensing something. That's, yeah, the most recent example is the sensor. Yeah, okay. So then make the sensor. Yeah. But how it gets to – look, if you need to make it for 20 bucks, by all means, you're going to have to do everything. But that's not really what we do in Australia. We make things for thousands of dollars. Yeah. So make the sensor. Put your effort into doing that. Let someone who knows how to do the other side do that. Yeah. One day when you sell a gazillion of them, by all means, bring them together. But get to market. Um, in a reliable way, yeah. I think off that then, um, so there's Syncrypt, there's uh, like API docs or something, so then bring it back to your interface. Yeah, although if you if you want to bring it back to your own interface, it's it, you can go through our API by all means, but you can also just literally click a setting on the orb, put your IP address and port in and go. So you don't need to talk to us. Um, just right. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, let's say if somebody wants to download a UDP server, uh, we can give that a go in in after pizza. I think that's the way it goes. Yeah, yeah. You can talk about seven thirty. Seven thirty. Okay. Well, should we get a start on some of the some of the demos and? Okay. So I, I tend to do this live because, you know, I've got a whole bunch of customers who don't mind me showing them, showing people their applications. And so I'll show you some of those today. But, you know, it's absolutely fraught with opportunity to go wrong because it is all live. And um, so let's go and look for some devices, first of all. So this is the Sinkwit portal. And um, these are categories of devices or clients uh, or groups of devices. And when you select a, a group, I'm not sure how many GPS, there's one sitting there in uh, Perth at the moment. A whole bunch sitting in Brisbane over there. So if we zoomed in on those Brisbane ones, select one, it's quite hard on this little screen. Go to its device page. Um, so this is a device that's sitting on uh, at Fisherman's Island. Last contact was a few seconds ago. So this is actually at the Port of Brisbane. So um, that truck, if we zoom in lots, I'm not sure. Yeah, you'll, you'll see. All right, so that's where the truck's been. Now he's only... We're only doing updates here, how often? Right, so we're doing updates every 10 seconds, so the track's not perfect on this particular vehicle. But that's what he does all day, this vehicle, because he's offloading containers and taking them to, uh, to, to the dock. And the use case here, I'll see if he's live. 
Yeah, okay. So he's, what are we, where are we? His speed is currently zero. It's pretty hot in Brisbane still. Supply voltage is zero. So the orb is still reporting, but he's turned the ignition off on this vehicle. Let's see if I can find one where the ignition is on. So. It's unlikely at half past seven. Okay, here's one. So this vehicle's currently doing, it's just slowed down. We can go and have a look on the portal, see what he's been doing in the last hour. Given that the speed limit on the port of Brisbane is 40 kilometers per hour, He's not terrible. He's not the worst we see. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure if I went and did that, it would get some. Yeah, there we go. There's a 71.1. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they speed. But the use case here is pretty simple. We're looking for some serial data over here. It's this string that, oh, good, my mouse works. Um, that string is what we're looking for because that string tells you the weight of the weight on every axle of that truck. So then you can know how much freight is going across the port. So that's the use case there. It's quite interesting that this must be a 12 volt truck. For a truck that size carrying containers, that's unusual. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, unless it's running off a 12 volt supply on the truck, but I don't think so because it's ignition switched. Um, and it's interesting as well that they've clearly mounted this thing somewhere under the seat or something because its pitch and roll are pretty, pretty awful. Um, Well, um, if it were upright, the pitch and roll would both be zero. This was 67 and 20. So, you know, and it always amazes me. The antenna is probably pointing towards the engine block now because he's done that. Yet, here we are, still transmitting. How do you find the uh, uh, RF signal in your agency? Very good. It's very, very good. Yeah. What's the uh, material itself? It's glass filled nylon. Yeah. But the antennas are tuned to the enclosures. So. Uh, this one is a, well, it's pretty clear what it is. It's a boat. So that's sitting on a boat. And it's on a swing mooring. And if you zoom in, you can see it depends on the wind direction. It's been swinging around a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's on a buoy. It's it's floating on a buoy, literally. So, um, so there's a geofence around that one. If it goes off that buoy, um, I mean that that's interesting and that's interesting. I don't know if you know on GPS sometimes when you get changes of uh, satellite, when the almanac changes, you'll suddenly get a single spot. I imagine that's what those two are. No, it looks like a single, yeah. And it's interesting because this install is actually below water level. So it's in the engine compartment of the boat below water level. So it's quite interesting that, you know, it's got to get, I don't know how it's seeing the tower, um, <laughs> but it does. And the tower is probably, I don't know, probably three, four kilometers away from this boat. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good. But never gets used because it's a boat. Oh yeah, boat does get used. So top speed on the boat's 33 k's an hour. And you know, here a single device can be doing position. It can be doing your speed. Um, we know what the temperature is in the engine compartment at 26, so we can put a warning on that. Atmospheric pressure because it's a boat. It's nice to know about wind and stuff like that. 
Um, no, these are all sensors. And you don't actually need much if you think about it, because GPS gives you the speed, the position. Um, the pressure sensor's on the orb already, so that's for free. The ambient temperature's on the orb, that's for free. Um, it's connected to the house battery, and it's connected to the engine battery. So now they can monitor remotely the battery voltages and if they need to go start the boat, uh, which is important because the bilge pump won't run if the battery's flat. So, so that's important. And this, we know the water temperature because there's a thermocouple going onto the thermocouple input. Um, again, you know, that's, that's very cheap. Um, and it's measuring using 4 to 20 milliamp sensors the um, fresh water and the um, black water on the boat. Uh, the pitch and the roll is interesting. If you suddenly get a roll on your boat, you better go look at what's happening on the mooring. Um, and vibration's even interesting because, you know, you can tell the severity of the storms it's been through on its mooring. So that was, we saw earlier on, it, it actually went to sea. It did something. So that was actually going at high speed. But a couple of nights ago, we had a pretty severe storm. I'm sure you guys would remember it. And so it registered 92 millig's of vibration or, or motion on that boat, um, which is almost as much as doing 30 k's an hour. So that would have been banging around on that mooring. And then you can do things, if you've got vibration, you can measure vibration hours. So if this was a, you know, a generator or something like that, you wouldn't have to actually connect to the hour meter. Because there's a difference between ignition being on and the thing actually running. Um, so just through vibration, we can measure that. So you'd expect, as, as you'd expect, in fact, I'll, I'll start using this one a little bit because I'm always making settings to devices in the field by mistake. So we have a device, that's, that's this one over here, and um, we have a thermocouple attached, and if you were to hold that, you know, in time the number will go up there. That's not particularly exciting, but it, but it will. Um, <laughs> so um, we've obviously got little widgets all over the screen. If you go onto the settings page on this device, so. The essence of the device is, you think about, it can run off AA batteries, so it's got to draw absolutely no power. So we spend a huge amount of time um, making the timing flexible on this thing. So you, you can, this one's reporting every five seconds at the moment, but you could make that report every 10 minutes or if, once a day if you wanted, if you were running on AA's. Um, but you can do smarter things, like say you, were, you, you had a, a dam uh, and the dam was filling up. Probably you could measure the dam level Every half hour, that's probably okay. So you'd make it measure every 30 minutes. If you were running off batteries, there's no point in transmitting every time because so what? So you could transmit once a day. Uh, so every 30 minutes you take a reading. Once a day you transmit uh, 48 readings. But then at some point during the day when you're taking your measurements, the dam level starts getting critical. Uh, the device will immediately transmit at that point, and then you can switch the transmit interval to become a lot more granular. So all those kinds of, of timings have been built into this. And then you can do things like if you think um, if you think something like if, if it's up a pole, do you really need GPS? Uh, you might want it once every now and then in case someone's nicked it. Um, so you can, every, every peripheral on the thing, you can set the timing. So you can say, I want GPS you know, once a day, one reading a day, but I want uh, the, the uh, thermocouple, I want that every five seconds. So every single peripheral you can set up like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it goes without saying, especially to this audience, you, you could, everything is remotely configurable, absolutely everything. Um, and something we're going to try in a little bit is to set up a quick UDP server. So I need to change the Wi-Fi details on that device. Does anyone know what they were? <laughs> so another thing I really like about these devices is Anything that you've changed recently, you can see in the command queue here. 
Um, and for all you code nerds, you'll notice that it's all just JSON. So there's, there's always a, a key or an, an index and a value. So the entire de device is, is based on JSON. Okay, so um, it's gone green, which means it's, uh, it's been sent. It doesn't mean it works. All right, we've got an IP address, so we're good. Okay, great. Uh, that'll allow us. So you know, it's it's just everything on this thing, of course, is in field, in field, um, updatable. Um, so all the internal settings, things like um, we actually use a light sensor sensor for tamper. So if I enable that, we should get a tamper alert. Thermocouple, right, I was looking at the wrong one. That's gone up. Let's change that to a uh, chart. So the thermocouple, yeah, there you go. That's when you, you picked it up. That's much better. So um, if you, there's a few things, a few answers to that. Um, we'll keep it, we've got a few plans on the portal. So if you, on the standard plan, we'll guarantee that we'll only keep it for a month. So you don't pay anything. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, I should say we, we've got a little star. It's $5 a month, but we don't charge it for two years. And really, the plan is not to charge it. It's just it's a contingency. If Amazon change something or Google change something, we may have to one day. We don't know. So that, so it's, it's free. We'll store your data for a month. You get access to the portal. You can change your settings. You can update new firmwares. Um, so, and then if you go onto a plan which will cost you 15 bucks a month, then we'll see, keep it for two years um, and do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so, for instance, you know, even on the free plan, you can go in here and we can put in on events, we can put in some email addresses and some SMS, some numbers, and it'll SMS you and email you alerts. On the free plan? Yeah. Um, but we limit you. So, the number you get, I think, is five SMSs a month or something like that per device, so it's enough. Um, by the way, there's the JSON pair for enabling the temper. Um, yeah. um, actually, you, you were asking earlier, Neil. <laughs> yeah, so firmware updates, we, we can accomplish a firmware update over MQTT in, you know, I saw one today and it do it in about four minutes. So, um, yeah, it's pretty quick. Um, so, something that is, uh, yeah, something that's probably most special about these orbs, though, is the ability to write JavaScript. So, I said to you that everything was arrived, or all data is handled as JSON, whether it's settings or whether it's the raw data arriving back from the device. And you can actually turn on the raw data stream. Uh, all right, so I've turned on the raw data stream just so I can show you what it looks like because it'll make more sense when you we start looking at the coding. So we've got a timestamp over there. Uh, there's the ambient temperature. The, the, the index is just ambient. We've got TC1, which is thermocouple 1, which is what you were holding there. And thermocouple 1 is now 31.81. Um, so every every piece of information we measured, did you just see it change there to a couple of points? Um, every piece of information we measure obviously has a an index or a key and, and it has a value as a pair. So when you want a script, you can actually access any of this just by referring to its key. Um, and some things will be structures like that, but again, you can just refer to them by their index. Um, you get some really complicated ones. If I choose a device, so we, does everyone know what CAN bus is? On vehicles, you've got a, a bus around the vehicle and everything's connected to it. If I chose a device that was streaming 
canvas. Um, this one's quite interesting because no, screen won't zoom. Um, I think we're measuring around 27 things on this single orb. So there's quite a lot of data here. Um, and these are all CAN messages that are arriving. We've got 27 CAN sensors on this on this particular orb. And um, yeah, so there's there's the raw data coming off it. So the CAN data is stored as an ID in data. So in CAN, you have a, a so-called PGN, or for J1939, which is common. You have a PGN, you have data, and that's that's how we'll store it. So that's all the CAN data arriving on the, the left on the left there. So if you wanted to get ambient temperature, you could refer to it literally as ambient. So where that becomes important is so there was the can method you set up using the scripting. Yes. And and I'll show you actually it's a good one. I'll show you that script later because that's quite a monster script. Um, so so that's the thing. It's quite powerful because with most with telematics devices, and I, I, I use the word telematics because it goes in a car. So if it were a telematics device, it would be pre-programmed to understand common CAN languages. So it might understand a TO to this and a, you know, a, a whatever forward that. And it might understand heavy vehicle CAN. But the moment you add your own sensor, there is no way that telematics device can understand what message has just arrived on the bus. So we, we again, we don't play in standard put a dot on the map. That's not our market. We play where you want a dot on the map, and then you've got something else on the vehicle you want to measure from a sensor, or, or, or more complex, from a trailer. Um, and and that's, it really works well for us, because you can, you can write a script to identify all the CAN messages. So um, back to this one. If you want to write some code, you just click on that little scripting button over there. And now you're going to find out how bad my JavaScript is. So you can just literally you know, write your JavaScript in that window there. Uh, oh, yeah. Is that better? Oh, much better. Thank you. So um, there's a library here, uh, the Senquip library. Uh, you'll find we've made quite a big effort. Unlike most engineers, the documentation's pretty thorough. So if you go to the language reference, um, there's a language reference here that is really well written, um, and it'll go through all the method, all the functions, all the various um, built-in functions, but at the end are the sendquip functions. So we can write functions to do things like turn the output on, send a message over serial, uh, parse data. Um, so, so, so things we think will, that you will find interesting, uh, we can write functions for. And in fact, many of the standard C functions on the device, you can actually access through JavaScript, which is interesting too. So you'll find examples over there, um, get you up and going. We'll get to triggers in a moment. So. Um, we, we just load the, so all my terminology here is wrong because last time I write serious, serious code, it was in C. Um, but we're loading the Senquip libraries and we've got a function. Um, th this is really a simple example. All I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the thermocouple value in Celsius, converting it to Fahrenheit, comparing it to a value. If the value is high or low, I set, set an alert. But it shows that you can, so you've got to parse the data, the data into this object, into this um, variable called object. Um, so we, we parse that, that big packet you saw earlier on, the raw data gets parsed into this um, variable called object. And then we can say things like let degrees Fahrenheit equal object.tc1, thermocouple 1, times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. So now the value tc1 in Celsius is now in Fahrenheit. Uh, then here's a, a sequip written function. It dispatches that variable, which really means it gets sent. So, so like all the other measurements get sent, you can create your own custom measurements and have them sent by the device, and they'll pop up on the portal or on your server. So if you go back to 
the device, that data is appearing over there in Fahrenheit. So it, is, it started out its life as Celsius, and it's now popped up over here as Fahrenheit. So when you dispatch a variable, you tell the, the orb to send that variable, you actually need to tell it, dispatch it um, into, so we, we have these things called custom parameters. So you can dispatch a variable into a custom parameter. So you go a little bit further down, you create your custom parameters. And so I've got one there called engine temperature. It's, it's custom parameter number one. It's called engine temperature and the unit is degrees Fahrenheit. I could change that and say, um, you know, let's be real, it's your hand temperature. Um, so in the code, over here, I say dispatch um, to custom parameter number one, the variable is degrees Fahrenheit, and I want it to two decimal places. So I change the one to a two, download the code again, reboot. So that's how easy it is to download the code. Press the download button, give it a reset, and there's your hand temperature, and it's now to two decimal places, not one. So that's really how easy the scripting is on this thing. Um, pretty it's pretty fast, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty impressive. And then reconnects to Wi-Fi. Yeah, so yeah. It, it downloads the, 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 the new file, saves it to the file system, issues a reset, reboots, reconnects to Wi-Fi, and sends the first data. And it's like that. Yeah, that's, that's right. And probably the biggest delay there was the browser deciding to update. Yeah. So then um, we can do other things here. So, so we, you, know, you, you take a reading, you create your own variables, which I think is cool, because now you can take two, three different variables, apply maths, and, then, and, and actually supply useful data um, instead, of, um, instead of information that's not use, useful. Um, then you can do things like we can say, if degrees Fahrenheit is greater than the alarm threshold, then we dispatch an event, another senquip written function. Uh, and we're going to dispatch it, um, and we are going to, it's of type alarm, and we want the, the text to be over temperature. So now when, you, when that alarm arrives in the portal and an SMS gets sent to you, it'll say, hey, over temperature on this device. So, so Reda asks, who is Jason? Jason. <laughs> and how hard does it work? <laughs> For us, very impressive. So that, that's probably the simplest function you know, ever written, uh, JavaScript function ever written, but I think it demonstrates the principle. Um, and to me, the, the other thing that excites me is this idea that you can pause information that's arriving on serial. That's the cool one to me, because who wants to pause a serial string? It's meaningless. It's, it's binary. So now there's, there's something else I didn't show you, but we've got some buttons here. And so what you can do, for instance, is press the button light on, and then the light goes on. What's actually happened there is it's not as simple as it may seem. We've written a piece of JavaScript. The orb contacts the server um, every, whatever, five seconds in this case, and it says, are any buttons pressed? Yes, I see you pressed a button, a button number one. So I'm going to run a JavaScript on this device associated with that button. And that's quite powerful because you can do things like, in this example, it was just turning a light on, turning a light off. But you can start an engine. You can, don't start an engine. But <laughs> you, you can do some quite interesting things. You can press a button and have an entire script run, which might turn on something keep watching it, wait till it comes up to temperature, do something else, so you can invoke all kinds of interesting outcomes from pushing a button. And again, how hard is that to do? If trigger parameter 1 is pressed, set output on. You know, that, that's, that's it. So... It's pretty simple to do some. Yep, and then further down, there are the trigger parameters. 
So it's light on and it's green. And here's, you know, this is a more interesting example. Um, and in fact, this, I quite like this one. So I had a customer who wasn't necessarily the brightest. And he had four Modbus devices. And they were these things that came from China that had no instructions. They didn't have a nice Bluetooth interface. And he needed to change the address on them as he was installing them. And there's no way he was going to be able to work with a computer, never mind an RS-485 converter and all of this. So I wrote four buttons on his screen. And when he pressed the button, it sent the Modbus command to change the address on the device at that address to a new address. And that's actually what those last two are doing there. So he could put a device on the network, press the button, change my address to two, done, put another one on, change to three, done, change to four, done. And that's fantastic because now suddenly somebody with no idea <laughs> can set up a network of devices. It's great. <laughs> yes, yeah, set up your entire factory. <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I really loved that. And by the way, there's the um, 12K code. Yeah. So, let me so, so, yep. yeah, so, then, so with you, those buttons, I guess the only caveat is the response to those buttons based on the sample time. Exactly, because the device is sleeping. It's it's not interested. Yes, it has to make contact with the server. Yep. Script have access to the network itself. You like scripts to other devices in the network. So the developers would hate me saying this. But if you know enough about the device, it's very likely that you could write a script to, for instance, form a UDP or TCP connection with another Wi-Fi device on the network. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's not in the docs. That's not in the docs. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, you can do things here. You know, you can download all the raw data and. <laughs> So I'll show you some real examples of um, of scripts. Is there one in the Philippines? Yeah, there's there is one in the Philippines. Yeah. Oh, are you? Yeah. Okay. So now I need to remember the name of the company. I can never pronounce it, which is why I can never remember it. You recognize that place? <laughs> <laughs> So this one over here is, is that one I showed you earlier that's got the 27 can bits of information coming through. And here is the script behind that. So essentially what it's doing is, again, parsing the JSON data. Then it's saying, well, how many can messages did I receive during my last measurement interval? And then uh, if the ID is that, then pause, take those bytes out of the can message and scale them by, what are we doing here? Uh, multiplying by 0 0.008 uh, and then dispatch it as a variable. Um, so we've done some interesting things here. You can, you know, when, you, when you're parsing data, you want that byte and that byte. Oh, no, hang on. I want that byte and that byte. So depending on the endianness, you might want that one or that one. So you can switch endianness with a negative there. But, you know, that's, so that's a real script that somebody's using every day. Um, 3.6K. So this is just cycling around. If, if, if you want. No, it's running at once every every time it wakes up. So what what's actually happening here is that um, the CAN bus has been set up. So the one there means on every base interval, the CAN will be sampled. Uh, that's just the board rate. It's going to listen to the CAN network for two seconds, and then it's going to stop. And we could have put specific IDs in that we wanted to capture, but because it's blank, it'll capture everything. So what we've tried to do here is 
the setup of the peripheral assists you with your JavaScript. So you don't have to write everything in JavaScript. So for instance, in serial here, this is a, a better example. Um, if I turn the serial on, you can select 232 or 485. If you want to capture something, you can put in the start string, you can put in the end string. If you need to actually request something from a device by sending it a serial message, you can put that in here. So kind of capturing the data is completely sorted out by the peripheral. The data will arrive and all your JavaScript needs to do is just pause it and do, do the, the valuable stuff. Uh, and again, so in this case, we will capture, we will listen to that serial port for five seconds. Or, or we'll stop when they're 500 characters. And, and, you know, what gets more interesting, and there are edge cases where it gets, gets complicated, but in theory, you could make it wake up every five seconds and listen for five seconds. You know, and, and I have tested this where I run A, B, C, D, E, F through the alphabet constantly, and I make it capture for five seconds on an interval of five seconds and make sure we don't miss a character. Um, I don't like that because to me that's edge casey stuff. You know, that's I was off transmitting, and something happened. But in yeah, 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 exactly. So in theory you can do that sort of thing, but I'd much prefer, you know, if your message is arriving every five seconds, make your interval ten and wait for five seconds. You'll capture the message. So. And it's interesting as well, you start with a product like this and you, you have a handful of settings and people keep asking for more and more features and there's this trade-off between we'll add the features here um, or no, that's so specific to you, right? You go write your own script because you can make it into a nightmare of settings. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, I was just thinking that you've covered quite a lot of, quite a lot of things here, like I would have felt once you had the custom scripting, that, that probably would have got read it for me, you know, like, all right, now I'm just going to show you how to use that for different stuff. Yeah, and in, in, in retrospect, if we started again, I think we would have said, fewer settings, there's your scripting. Yeah. But, you know, we made the device and we added the scripting. So you had a lot of these settings in and then scripting, is that what you're mm -hmm. saying? Yeah, scripting was a big body of work. Yes, yeah. So. And, you know, there's also things like, is, is your output an output or is it a digital analog input? So, and then behind each of those, if it's an input, do you want warning and alarms? If you want warning and alarms, is the hysteresis? Is the hysteresis different for the warning and the alarm? You know, um, do you want to run filtering? Because we considered having settings here for would you like, you know, low pass filter? Nah. Nah. No, that's right. You can wake up on, on, on an input. You can wake up on vibration. Um, I think that's those are the two sources. We haven't done fancy things like wake up on serial data. Yeah. Um, what else was I going to show you? Yeah, okay, let's try and do some interesting things. There's other things you can do. So if you press set up on here, who's got a phone that they're willing to sacrifice? <laughs> no, it won't be bad. All right, I've pressed set up on there. If somebody goes to a phone, and you you should see a new Wi-Fi network called Orb Dash G E F two or something. Okay, okay, there you go. All right, so do you want to show everyone what you've now got? Essentially, what you're seeing up on the screen there is now coming from this device. So that little ESP is now acting as a web server over Wi-Fi, and all of those settings are replicated there. Now. Do you want to bring up your UDP, UDP server? server. Yeah. All right. So if I go to, so you can leave that up. So, and look, this is stressing the poor old device. It's, it's on a five second interval. It's streaming MQTT to here. It's got a web server up there. And now we're going to. That's that whole same web page. No. Yeah. No, not, not all of it. A yeah. So the graphics are dumbed down, uh, but pretty much all the settings are there. The values will be there. Um, is it supposed to say over temperature? Uh, it'll be saying yeah. over temperature, yeah, because I've set the, um, so you'll be getting that here too. Yeah, so he's just noticed the same warning on there. Uh, I need to be on the same device. Uh, you logged into that one, which is 
that one. So I'd set a custom alert for hand temperature is now over, over temperature. Wow. So that's those alerts. So yeah, exactly. So he's seeing exactly what we're seeing. Now we're going to go into settings and we're going to go to endpoint. And what is the, your IP address? Is so 192.168.0.2.10. And what's your port? 4.9.7.2. So does this have two Wi-Fi cards in it? No. One is access one. One. Which is it's pretty impressive. If you think about what all it's doing right now, is there anything arriving on there yet? It'll probably take a few seconds. So I have to refresh. Yeah, you, yeah. What's probably going to happen to you actually is you've done nothing for so long that it would have exited setup mode. Okay. Oh, and and in fact, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering how that was. Yeah, but it, but it will maintain. I've done it before where I've had that going, this going, and that going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting the JSON. Okay. GPS at page drop. Yeah. So, you know, so you asked how difficult is it to stream it to a third party server? And that was just set up over here. And look, I chose UDP because it's easy, but we could have done HTTP or MQDT, just probably wouldn't have worked today in a demo environment. So. And can it take, can I send something back over here? No. We're not running a UDP server here. Not yet. <laughs> Ask again next week. <laughs> I think it disconnected. Yeah. After that refresh, it disconnected from your wi -Fi. Yes, the moment the light stops flashing. I mean, we could try. Uh, it's still streaming JavaScript? It is. Oh, yeah, it is, yeah. I okay. want to see if it can simultaneously connect. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is the poor thing. But it's very impressive. I want to break it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't find it. No, I'll keep looking. It'll, it'll come. Um, yeah, yeah, it'll come. Got it? Yep. Can I just refresh the page? Yep. Oh. It'll, it'll, you'll, you'll have to go back to your browser, and um, right. hopefully your browser hasn't forgotten the details. I the oh, OK. I, I, I got that. Yeah. <clears throat> Streaming stopped now. Uh, has the streaming stopped? Oh, I haven't seen one for a while. Yeah, I'm almost surprised. In. You're back in. So has your streaming stopped? Stop. I think it's one at a time. Whoever makes the latest request, I think. That it could be. Off. I'm pretty sure I've done it before. But I, anyway, it doesn't matter because it's a useless use case. Yeah, sure. But it's, um, yeah, I just find this so impressive. So that's, um, we're probably a little bit over time. Um, there's a lot more I could show you in here because um, it's, yeah, it's a pretty Im impressive little device. Yeah, but that was, that's, yeah the whole interface can be very well thought out. So it's, um, one thing was, sort of how long it's taken the idea to yeah. do this. I'd say, you know, we were thinking about this in the car. We, we reckon there's probably 6,000 hours in this um, in total. Yeah. I mean, I know just the enclosure design was 1,000 hours, the ideation and design. Um, and, and, and yeah, may, maybe not quite that much, but it was, it was close. And so you think, you know, in, in Australian terms, the investment one's made, um, you've got to sell a lot of units to get that back. So the hardware cost is irrelevant. Yeah. Um, and that, so, um, like, you think about the enclosure design, could you say you've had, like, an industrial design on the team that then third parties and assisted with that? No. No. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a very small little team um, that's put this together. So, it's, it's, a, it's a, to me, it's a very impressive, you know, accomplishment. Um, but the nice thing is now that we've got this IP, you'll notice that, you know, it's the same screws. It's, it's a lot of the styling is the same now. It's the same. So the second one didn't take nearly as long. Um, and in fact, the code that's going to run on this one and the code running in that one is the same code. 
So there's only one code base for all the devices, all the variants. Um, so. So what's the part of obviously the form? Yeah. What's the difference between that, right? external antennas? Yeah, external antennas, um, which are waterproof and clip in, because we find everyone breaks screw in antennas. Um, it's got extra, a couple of extra pins over here. So the first variant's got dual CAN buses. So you can go trailer and you can go uh, vehicle, or you can go sensor network and vehicle. Yeah. So I think we'll be the first that I've ever seen with dual CAN on a on a tracking box or a telematics box. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you could actually do uh, dual CAN on here and Modbus. So, yeah. Oh, with I two C, um, you know, I two C is probably one I would fight um, because you know, and I'm the features guy. I want everything on it. But I two C, I think, is great over ten centimeter distances. Um, you know, going to meter or something, you'd probably be asking for trouble. I mean, one wire we didn't put on this. Maybe we should have put one wire on it. Uh, but the use case is pretty limited. You know, with one wire. It's almost mostly hobbyists using it. I haven't found serious industrial yeah. players. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. But you know, we, we wouldn't do an interface box. I'll show you why. They exist. We've got a, um, a distributor called Macquarie. And well, I won't go there now, but they've got this really wonderful brochure. And on the brochure, they've got all of these, these CAN devices interconnected in this web from output devices, input devices, precision input devices, temperature controllers, and then on the end of it's the orb. And you know, so it's this whole network of stuff. And then they've got an identical one on the next page with all of that stuff in Modbus. And I think you know, that to me is just is double R in Macquarie. Um, it's to me that that is just if you're designing a vehicle or something that's got to be the way to go instead of trying to design your own boxes go to a company like that pay a hundred bucks for a little multiplexer box join the whole thing together um, done yeah So these are just because you're all techies. These are all the diagnostics that are coming in in the background. So if we killed the Wi-Fi on that device, we could quite quickly tell you know who it was connected to, which tower, all kinds of things. So that's probably that's. Probably me. Any other questions or something we talked about? Might be interested in uh, on board storage. Yeah, good point. So um, if it goes out of range, it will buffer. So it's got about a megabyte of memory to buffer. Um, yeah. We probably spoke about it, but um, yeah, yeah. So all you got to do, just enable the online offline buffer. So when it comes back online, it automatically tries to dump things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we've we've had quite an interesting one recently. Um, we've got a vehicle that's sitting in the middle of nowhere, and we're operating on a four G network. It's in the middle of nowhere. And there's this, this, the networks are really weak. So somebody stuck a, a Telstra booster on the top of this vehicle. But they forgot to set the booster to 4G. So it can automatically switch. And every now and then it switches to 3G because there's a tower somewhere. As this machine's turning, it suddenly picks up 3G. And the booster antenna is sitting that far from us. So it drowns out any other chance of receiving any other signals and we lose reception. And that can be for hours. Um, and it's quite interesting to watch in the diagnostics how the, um, the, the, you can see the buffer filling up, filling up, filling up, and then suddenly it gets connection and it dumps and you see it filling up and dumps. 
So, yeah. And, and so that would be obviously once it connects, you get like a history of device logs. So obviously you won't see it come up in real <coughs> time. Yeah. Yeah. So those diagnostics come through with every time it tweaks up? No, it, it would be too much data. So it's a, it's a separate MQTT topic that's less regular than the data. All right, well, yeah, no other questions. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Eve, Norman. Uh, come in, show us. It's a really interesting one. Um, Thank you. There's a lot of, like, as you said, you can see there's a lot of thought going into sort of every part of it from not just the device, but like the interface and all the areas. And I think most of us here would appreciate how much time it would take to even get to a web interface of this depth and detail for the device <laughs> functions. Um, and, Yes. <laughs> and yes. documentation that wasn't written by a stack overflow. So. <laughs>